Before we begin this week's episode, I want to pay a tribute to a close friend of mine, as well as a close friend to a lot of our listeners. Last week, Pandey Sunil Kumar, better known as Baba or Babaji to many, uh, passed away suddenly from a heart attack in his home in Iwaki City in Fukushima. Baba was the owner of Iwaki City's beloved Indian cuisine restaurant, Purnima. With a mixture of arguably Japan's best curry, not really arguably, it is, and Baba's one-of-a-kind welcoming personality, it is no wonder that his restaurant would become one of the more popular meetup spots in Iwaki for Japanese and expats alike. Everyone that walked through those doors was treated like a lifelong friend, not a customer. His impact on my life, especially my life uh, in Iwaki while on jet for three years, is immeasurable. I'm going to miss my chats with him, whether it be a quick chai while passing through, or a lunch with my family, or a dinner that ends up turning into bottomless beers and hookah. I'm going to miss attending WrestleMania, him FaceTiming me saying he's looking for me in the crowds on his live stream. I'm going to miss the opportunity to hear that laugh, uh, to hear him call me Dougie baby and tell me all about immortal love. His passing came way too soon and so many people lost a good friend and Iwaki lost a little piece of its soul. But despite his passing, his spirit and his legacy will live on forever. Rest in immortal power, Baba. I love you, brother. Hello, I'm Doug, and welcome to the Crew of Japan podcast, a weekly podcast where we take you on audio journeys through Japanese culture. Welcome back to the podcast. In today's episode, we're going to talk about Netflix's popular documentary series, Age of Samurai, Battle for Japan, and shine the light on some often overlooked players in the Sengoku or Warring States period, the Lady Samurai. We are thrilled to have the opportunity to chat with Tomoko Kitagawa, a Japanese and mathematics historian. Tomoko shares with us her professional journey, wonderful insight into the Lady Samurai and their impact during the Sengoku period, and how the curriculum for a 16-person class ended up leading to a Japanese national best-selling book. So let's just dive right on in. All right, so today we have Jen with us. Hey, Jen, how you doing? Hi, Doug. Thanks for having me. Heard we're talking about samurai. Yeah, actually, specifically, the age of samurai. Have you, uh, have you been able to uh, catch that on Netflix, the uh, documentary series that they put out recently? I actually have, but not by choice, honestly, I will have to say. Um, I, oh, really? I'm surprised. Well, <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It sounds very surprising coming from me, the person that <laughs> loves everything about Japan, it seems like. But I'm not really a history buff. Fair enough. Fair enough. It, yeah. It's, yeah. It, it, just, it just never appealed to me. I never did good in history classes in school. Um, but my husband, he's the history buff. And it doesn't matter what country he's learning about the history. He loves it. So yeah. when he saw it, he was like, oh, this would be a great thing for us to watch together. So that's kind of how I got into it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of just saw it um, pop up on Netflix, but didn't really didn't even notice it when it did. Um, the only reason I found out about it, I was listening to another podcast, uh, the History of Japan podcast, um, and uh, the the guy who runs it, Isaac Meyer, um, he said, due to my news found Netflix stardom, thanks to Age of Samurai, I'm like, wait, what? Hold on. Is so that, that when hearing that, it made me like, let me go back and look at this. Um, so before we get any further, you know, I just want to say, spoiler alert, we might be talking about stuff that they show on the show, but uh the statutes of limitation on who reunified <laughs> who reunified Japan um, might have been passed since it's you know like over what four hundred years ago. <laughs> so I think we're I think we're in the clear here to uh, spoiler away who who ended up coming out on top. But um, but yeah yeah I, I you know I saw it pop up on Netflix and um, you know that it's one of those things. I'm I, I like history. And, um, but I'm not like a but guy that goes out of my way to read history books to find out about the why and the where and the how. Mm-hmm. Um, but something, something about like samurai and stuff. I, I've been a big into martial arts and, and, and kenjutsu. Uh, and I've been training since high school. So, like, it's one of the things I've gotten into. So, anytime I see something about history and samurai together, it's like, oh, you know, hey, let me, get, let me give it a shot. But then I saw this was like number one on Netflix and I'm like, okay, this has to be good. 
Yeah, my my um, history with samurai teaching is very, very limited. Um, while I was studying abroad, I took a class called Samurai and Geisha. Oh, nice. Which was, yeah, it was a really nice class, but um, my teacher really focused on Geisha more than samurai. Uh. So I didn't have the opportunity to learn too much about samurai. And when I did... The book that we um, read, which I don't know the title of it, and I can never find it ever again. I don't know why I can't find this <laughs> book anymore. But it was more like the way of the samurai, like their lifestyle and code. Okay. Um, it wasn't about the history per se, but almost like the lifestyle, the lifestyle. that they, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, and and surprise, like, you know, you were in Kyoto, so I don't, I'm not surprised that they focus more on geisha than samurai there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, um, but so, so like, what was? I mean, I, I guess there was a lot of stuff that happened. It's a short, it's a short series for those that aren't as familiar with it um, and are interested in maybe checking it out after this podcast. Um, it's a s- five or six episode series. Oh my gosh, I should know this off the top of my head, but um, it was short. It's not like a marathon where you need to sit down and commit, like you know, a full weekend or something to it. Um, it's something you can probably knock out over a couple days if you just watch an episode or two at a time. Um, and they're about 45 minutes to an hour long. So it's really a, a, a not a big commitment because I know some people are uh, afraid to commit to shows that have multiple seasons that are like 10 or 10 or pl- 10 plus episodes long. So this is not that. Um, yeah, it was a really easy watch. Yeah, yeah. And it kind of starts off, they introduce some of the major players, you know, Oda Nobunaga is like the first one that comes in, um, you know, introduce him. And, uh, and then they kind of go through the story of how it just goes from one person to the next and how these series of events kind of play off of each other or happen, which end up, you know, in the end, uh, with Tokugawa Ieyasu in power. And he's the one that actually reunifies Japan. So, and, and became the Shogun. So he was, uh, you know, thanks to him and, and, and his kind of track, cause he kind of, he's there in the forefront for a bit, but. He's also, I would say he's like a side player most of the time. He's not, he's there, but he's like a supporting cast. He's not like a main star, even though he's like the star in the end. Yeah. I mean, with the series, because it's so short and I mean, the way it's done, you know, you have half of it's like actor reenactments of what happened. And then you have these historians coming in and putting, you know, the narrative and because it's so short, you know, they can only cover so much. So, like, during right. that time period, there's so much going on, honestly, in Japan. You know, not only do you have samurai, but you have ninja in there, um, Christianity. I mean, there's so much to be covered, but, you know, they can only cover so much. Yeah, I mean, they, they have to glance over a lot of things, um, you know, like the introduction of, like, firearms and stuff like that to, like, the Japanese like armies and, and armies of samurai, you know, they started training people with weapons like that as opposed to swords. So, I mean, it wasn't, you're not talking about like, you know, heavy artillery or anything like that, but you know, one of those like muskets or something that can, you know, give them some long range, quick, quicker reload than maybe a bow and arrow um, and more lethal. Um, so, you know, there were, there was a lot of things that they kind of glanced over um, and you really couldn't fill in a lot of gaps. And, and and one of the things too, I think a lot of like comments or reviews were that they elaborated or, or they kind of played things out for dramatic, uh, dramatic purposes. But I mean, you got to remember it's a Netflix show. <laughs> yeah. Their priority is the main general public. It's not to people who yeah. love Japan. They're like trying to go for people who are going to watch something real fast that just want something, you know, on maybe in the background as they cook, you know, they're, they're looking towards the bigger picture, not a small niche group of people. Yeah. And, and it's, it's definitely one of those things that, uh, you know, if you're not as familiar, um, that's okay. Um, because, you know, you may not know to nitpick or what, what to nitpick. For example, I knew about the Sengoku period, but I wasn't fully fleshed out on, you know, who's who and who did what, you know, where did the battles take place and things like that. Um, and to use a term that a lot of my, uh, podcasts that I, when I was listening to the game of Thrones podcast back in the day, um, they talked about jetpacking and like flying around the country. Like, you know, all of a sudden this warring army is across, you know, in a completely different region. Um, and it kind of does that in the episode. There's not, they, you know, they, they, 
skip over time and there's probably a lot of things that occurred during those two periods too yeah but i would like to say give it props for because i know about the samurai lifestyle um i will say they did that really really well you know it's a time when samurai you know you tried to keep your most loyal um personnel next to you but you can't really trust them and you know combat is like super close together so you know you have really brutal brutal battles i mean they do really well with that aspect of samurai culture yeah uh, you know i'd i'd hate to be the people who have to clean up the battlefield after some of those battles because yeah i I don't know how or i'm sure they it was cremation and stuff but i I wouldn't want to be one of those people pulling around pulling around the uh the cart looking for survivors and (laughs) well actually now that we're talking about the violence (laughs) i will say my favorite part and i don't know why this this sounds so bad but it's just so funny to me is the part in the series which spoilers alert um when you know they bring the head over a decapitated head of a there's plenty soldier. of them around there and the- they sh- <laughs> yeah but they show him they show him like i guess this guy was super important or whatever but they show him the head and he's just sipping on his i guess it's sake and just like ah yes that's just admiring the head like oh yes that is, that's a nice head that you have there and i'm like what what like that's so oh, that's so yeah crazy. oda nobunaga was just he's ruthless i i I, I I heard the name before. I didn't. I knew that he was not a great figure. In, in I mean, he was great in terms of he was one of the biggest you know pillars of like moving towards this. Um, but as a human, as a person with <laughs> with morals, he lacked morals. <laughs> he didn't. He was just like he was out for his own power, and uh, he was cutthroat. And it was some of the scenes that he was in were just brutal. Brutal, brutal, brutal. But I feel like I feel like that's how it was back in those times. Everyone yeah. was so desensitized kill kill. by uh, everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they and again, one thing about the the series too, they didn't really pull any punches when it came to, like you said, like the gruesome nature of some of the acts that happen. You know, decapitation, beheadings, seppuku. Like when you know they were showing people like going down to the the, the cellar, the basement, the lower level of whatever they, <laughs> you know, whatever they called it. Yeah. Um, but going down there and you know performing the act whether it was a solo job or you know you and someone else dishonored the family name and whatever and you are about to lose let me go down there and take care of business um you know it's it was very very i guess uh, they didn't pull any punches in that regard you know i was i was kind of surprised uh but not super surprised but i was like wow this this is great they're like really kind of shining a light on a lot of different aspects of that time period yeah, yeah. But you know, one one aspect that they did shine a light on, I had no idea. Um knew nothing about it was um was some of the other players. Like they, they introduced a lot of the big names, you know, your Oda Nobunaga's, your Tokugawa Ieyasu's, your uh Hideyoshi Oh god, I can't even pronounce his name sometimes. Uh Hide to- Tomoyoshi? Oh my goodness. Um uh, the guy <laughs> that's on the uh I want to say is it the Ichiman? No. Senen? No, no. It's uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi uh, and um, Date Masamune. Masamune. You know, they, those big names. Those are the guys that everyone kind of knows. Um, but one thing they really shined a good light on was um, something that I had never heard of until the show, and that was the Lady Samurai. And um, it's a concept and a, a, a narrative that was introduced to the world by, um, you know, it's, it was documented here and there, but um, it wasn't until a, a historian named uh, Tomoko Kitagawa started doing a lecture series to feature these female characters that played a, a significant role in the lives of the big names, you know, and they were there. They were like somewhat the the negotiators. They were the ones that were behind the scenes kind of helping assist, you know, the, the husband or uh, I think, for example, uh, Toyotomi uh, Hideyoshi's like wife was like his his rock. You know, like they kind of did things in tandem um, running the country. So um, there were a lot of like lady samurai that were out there that um, this show really highlighted and kind of put a spotlight on their roles in, in Japanese history. And Tomoko Kitagawa was one of the first to really highlight that um, during her lecture series 
at Harvard, but then eventually she converted that into a book in Japan, which became a national best-selling novel or book in, in Japan back in 2012. So um, without further ado, uh, we are going to transition over to our interview with Tomoko. Uh, it was fantastic, and I really hope you guys will enjoy. All right, so we are super excited today on our podcast. We have Tomoko Kitagawa, who is a uh, well-traveled historian, a Japanese best-selling author, and most importantly, a Netflix superstar. Uh, she was one of the narrators on the, the Netflix hit documentary series, uh, Age of Samurai, that just recently came out. Uh, so good morning to you. Good morning and good evening to you all. How are you doing? Great, thanks. How are you? Doing good. I'm glad it's a Friday. Right. <laughs> Um, you know, ready for the weekend. Um, but yeah, well, thank you so much for joining us today on our podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're just going to dive right in to our questions. We have quite a few. Um, oh, mm -hmm. and, and the first one is one that we kind of ask a lot of our guests when they, uh, when they come on our podcast is, uh, first of all, whether or not you have some kind of connection to New Orleans, whether it's right. you've traveled to New Orleans before, or maybe, uh, when you hear New Orleans, uh, What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Right. Um, I think I visited there in 2010 for a conference. Oh, really? Okay. And I think that was right. Um, only for three days. But I was really excited to see all those places related to jazz. Oh, that's great. That's great. Right. So I think I joined a walking tour of some sorts and walked around. Was it, was it a ghost tour or cemetery? No, no. It wasn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> But to visit some of the places, um, yeah, on foot. Oh, great. So I think that was something, right, I quite enjoyed. And I stayed in the heart of the quarter. I think it's called the quarter? or yep, the, the French, French quarter. quarter. Right, That's right. So it was like really exciting occasion for me. And I would love to go back and see more. Oh, please mm. do. If you ever do, let us know. Uh, we'll take you out for some beignets and coffee. Oh, great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> on, on Japan Society, New Orleans and us. So... Please, please come back and visit. Oh, definitely. I'd love to do that. Um, and, you know, for the listeners that are listening to our podcast now who may not be familiar with your background, uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so I was born in Japan in Kyushu and studied uh, until high school here and moved to Canada and studied mathematics. Um, so I majored in mathematics and life sciences, minored in political science um, at that time, and I met fabulous two teachers who I really admired and um, they were the Japanese history teachers. So um, I decided to study history and became a historian. Um, so um, it just in short, uh, I'm a historian of Japanese history and also a uh, history of mathematics. So right now you probably can hear my accents a little bit, you know, um, little bit of American, a little bit of uh, British. So I, Yeah, I hear the British right. here and there. <laughs> <laughs> so I now live in Oxford and um, um, I'm just temporarily here in Japan um, due to the pandemic, but um, usually staying in Oxford. And so I do a lot of uh, writing work and also I do a lot of filming work right now. So um, yes, there are so many things to do and hopefully that I get to you know, see more of America soon. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, like you mentioned, uh, uh, many of your degrees uh, and opportunities to study in the universities in New Orleans, or not New Orleans, excuse me, North America. Um, you know, at what point in your life did you decide to pursue educational opportunities outside of Japan? Well, I was a high school student and also majored in mathematics. So English was something that I never thought of studying um, you know, farther than just do past exams. Mm -hmm. So um, at that point, like I did not even think about living in, you know, Canada or America, but my best friend did. And um, I just thought like, whoa, like if she can do it. You know, <laughs> I would love to see, you know, like what it is like. So, you know, like high school students, you have a best buddy yeah. and like, you know, you like to do the same and so on. So her influence was uh, huge. And uh, I decided to study a little bit of uh, English uh, during the summer so i did the summer school and um realized like how fascinating it is to be living with um you know people with different backgrounds and so on so i, I was very excited and decided to um move on and studying 
at college there in Vancouver. So yeah, Vancouver was the first place I've been to, and that changed my life. There you go. This is how it happens. The same thing for me. You know, I, I I was planning initially to study abroad for a summer semester somewhere in Tokyo or somewhere in Japan,、um, and then I, I convinced my parents that hey, you know, a summer is really not that long. Yes, yes,、um, yes, yes, yes. You know, I should do a semester, <laughs> and then、right. then I kind of worked that into the, the story, and then.、Uh, <laughs> And then I was like, you know, Japanese semesters and U.S. semesters don't really line up. So if I go in the fall, then、right. it really messes up my spring semester. If I go in the spring,、mm-hmm. I have a weird <laughs> gap in the middle. I'm like, I really、right. should do a full year. <laughs> and、right. uh, I, I gradually like kind of built up that、um, willingness to let me、right. fly away、yeah. from the nest for a <laughs>、uh-huh. for a longer period of time. But that was my first time living alone,、uh, first time li-、right. going abroad. First time for a lot of firsts、uh, for that, so it's it's really scary, right? But it was exciting, it like you know, it was that thing where it forces you to、uh, grow as a person、mm-hmm. on your own、mm-hmm. and experience things that you never had experienced before.、Mm-hmm. So it's it's great. I, I love hearing other people's stories about that.、Mm-hmm. With um with your interest in math,、uh, did you have some kind of desire from the beginning to be an educator? Um, or is that something that you kind of developed along the way? Oh, so my parents were teachers,、okay. so I've seen them like you know teaching at school, and you know school events were so great, and、uh, I just love to be with、uh, you know friends and people you know in general. So I was really like yeah, not thinking too much about、uh, becoming an educator, but I had. An interest of taking part in that field. It was kind of in the back of your mind, mm-hmm. You... Mm-hmm. right? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. My, my mom was a teacher as well. So, oh, really? Yeah.、Mm-hmm. So that I kind of I grown up around teaching my grandma, my mom, my aunt.、Mm. So,、uh, so when I went and did that in in Japan, they were、mm. like, "Oh, you're going to be a teacher?" And I'm like,、eh, "For a little while." Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Where in Japan were you? I, I was I was located in、uh, Fukushima Prefecture. In Iwaki、oh, City, right? Yeah, right. for、uh, for three years. So that was a fantastic place, fantastic、mm-hmm. city.、Uh, I miss it every day. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah. So um,、right. before uh,、mm. before embarking on your appointment at Harvard as a lecturer,、uh-huh. um, I I was when I was doing my my research and my due diligence, um, I saw that you were <laughs> had served as a member of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan. That's right. Um,、mm-hmm. you know, did that? Did some of that time with the ministry impact the trajectory of your career? Like, did that? Was that something that was,、um, you know, that that shifted where you wanted to focus your your career path? Definitely,、um, it's still a big part of my life, actually. So when I worked in the field of international relations for real, you know, not just you know reading about it or hearing about it, but when I've been involved in The real world issues.、Um, that was an eye-opening moment for me, and you know that was the time I really thought about how the world runs and how history, how important history is, and so on. So, yeah.、Um, yes, that was the yeah main impact in my life, and I still often think about what the cultural、um, diplomacy would mean. So. It's still like always with me. This experience. Yeah, yeah. It's it's always important. You learn a lot from history. <laughs> Just、mm-hmm. what mistakes not to make. Or <laughs> definitely.、Um, so. yeah. You know, was was it difficult to transition from you know a, min- a member of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to being a lecturer?、Um, you know, that's that's two kind of very、right. different fields. So was right, it was it a、right. difficult transition for you, or was it immediate? Was it right after you finished that you went to become a lecturer, or was there a little gap in between? I think it was almost immediate. So、um, there were some months、um, where I went back to Princeton、um, and taught a little bit.、Um, that was the Japanese society、uh, class that I taught.、Okay. So it was like sociological approach to the you know contemporary Japan.、Mm-hmm. So that was like a change, but、um, it's not like I started to teach ancient Japan. So you know there is like a little bit of like sort of transition from the. World that I lived in, you know, the contemporary Japan, and teaching about it. So, like, slowly getting back into like a mode of teaching history. So that three months or four months, I think that helped a lot. And um, um, right, so I kept in touch with my friends、uh, from the ministry, and also、um, I lived around the same area. So 
Um, the last job I had、um, was in New York. So、um, moving from New York and you know studying at Princeton to、uh, moving in Boston area,、uh, Cambridge there.、Um, so it was like、um, you know three hours of、uh, Amtrak ride, and it wasn't too far. So I thought like you know that was like a gradual transition. I still can go back to New York,、um, seeing my friends, also be in touch with like you know current affairs and so on. So that was really、um, very gradual. And also, my students at Harvard、uh, were interested in diplomacy as well, so they were very curious and asking me about those questions.、Um, yes, from time to time. So、um, I always wanted to、um, tell them, like you know, how fascinating it is to be involved in the you know real time affairs and you know trying to do something about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like, especially as a student, you would want to tap into that and learn. Just you know, learn a little bit about that from someone who had、mm-hmm. that firsthand experience. That's great. Right. At, at Harvard.、Um, My understanding was that you primarily taught classes and courses on Japanese history,、um, one of which was your course that was that eventually kind of, you know, turned into a book,、uh, the the Lady Samurai.、Um, can you can you tell our listeners、uh, a little bit about this topic in general,、um, you know, and then after you know towards the end, like if you had to choose three,、um, three three of these、uh, Lady Samurai. Um, who would you say is the big three amongst them, and, and their、mm. lasting impact on Japanese history? Great, thanks for asking this.、Um, so I'll ask you a question just to、uh, explain who the Lady Samurai、uh, was as a group or as an individual. So who do you think the Lady Samurai? So I, I cheated because I saw、oh, the,、uh, the documentary.、Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I, I saw some of it, so I, I don't know all of them, but、uh, right. I would assume. I, I, The names are slipping my mind, but I know it was、uh, in some cases was the wife mm-hmm, mm-hmm. of some of the daimyo,、mm-hmm. as well as some of the the mothers of like the children as they were growing、right. up. Is that correct? So Doug knows a lot more <laughs> than、uh, <laughs> you know, many listeners, I hope. Right? <laughs> like I said, I did I did my research ahead of this interview. <laughs> <laughs>、um, so if, if I ask these questions、um, just casually, like you know, who do you think they are? They were. Um, the, the answer would be like maybe like those women who fought in the battle, like other men. So like they had like you know this great skills in like sword、um, and like you know what do you call like bows and you know like those、uh, traditional Japanese weapons. So the image was shaped、uh, by those popular、um, culture, you know, like dramas and many documentaries and so on. So my take was that、um, I also had this image that you know lady samurai would be like a samurai, you know, like the male samurai. But when I was reading it, I realized that they actually try to avoid、um, the physical fights as much as possible, and that was impressive. You know, like I was imagining them to be like you know、um, going into the field and you know riding on the horse and so on. There were some people like that, but the lady samurai that I introduce in my books、um, were those people who never wanted to fight and to kill anyone.、Um, so that was like a great sort of finding、uh, from the primary sources. So their letters and like their、uh, records of daily lives and so on. So、um, I was amazed、um, to see like you know the quality of women left in documents. So I call the lady samurai, or I look at those women、um, as a lady samurai, who were actually trying to avoid、um, any conflicts and try to、um, you know make、um, better world、uh, by not using、um, physical weapons. So、uh, those are the ones. And if I would like to introduce big three,、um, the First would be Nene, so that's the person you mentioned a little bit in the beginning.、Um, so that's the wife of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the unifier of Japan. So she has been known as a wife of the unifier, but she wasn't just a wife. So she was a mother to many、uh, adopted children, a、uh, children, and、um, she was like trying to help all of them, trying to maximize the chance of having. A balanced society, so that was like really an interesting sort of、uh, strategy that she took. So instead of like you know fighting and killing each other, she wanted to、um, make a good balance out of like who 
uh, were available and who were um, there to help the unification. So um, Nene is the first one that I would say an example of the lady samurai. And the second one is probably Higashi. So she is a mother of Date Masamune, so another famous uh, warlord. So um, Higashi was a mother and also um, from a very privileged house. So she had a brother who is a head of um, uh, her original house. So at one point, her son and her brother um, became like um, rivals. Um, so they, they started to fight and then that became the real, like, you know, um, real battle in the field. So she wanted to help and she wanted to stop this whole thing. So when you think about it, you know, how can she achieve this? You know, not to lose her son nor her brother. And she decided to go into the battlefield without weapon. Um, nothing around, but she just sort of, you know, marched in, in this like carriage, you know, that's like a really a privileged person's, you know, um, tool to show the dignity. So she went into the field um, without weapons and tried to negotiate. So help the two um, to talk to each other um, by letters. So by letter. So that was like really interesting sort of, you know, uh, shift of thoughts where like how the conflicts can be resolved um, and how a mother can help and how a sister can help. So this person was so amazing um, and she was so patient to do this negotiation for about 70 to 80 days. So that was like a long time, like, you know, to sit down and really like, you know, talk about negotiations and matters in detail. Were, were they in the same, like everyone was in the same place or were they sending letters back and forth as a form of negotiation? More or less at the same place. So um, the two were at the battlefield and they were really like, you know, in communication um, with each other. And she just never wanted to leave until um, two sides will make peace. So that was really an impressive sort of, you know, step to take as a woman. So um, that's my Lady Samurai uh, number two <laughs> and uh, number three is actually a group so the number three is um, who I call the negotiators so um, those are the people who try to come up with a peace treaty um, you know not um, just to prevent um, the further conflicts and so on so um, those are the group of um, old mothers so they're like grandmother sort of status but also nuns. So they went into the Buddhist um, um, temples and you know, learned a lot about um, Buddhist you know, um, principles, uh, doctrines. So they're um, ordained nuns, but they tried to stop the battle between the Toyotomi and the Tokugawa, so two of the major forces um, of the Japanese unification. So um, they really tried to talk and it was very interesting to see that it was not one of the main figures or uh, the male vassals, you know, the master vassals, you know, like those people who went out to the house and talked. Like they didn't, have, you know, that just did not happen. But women, especially ordained nuns, they could actually talk to the opponent. So they made trips from one house to another and tried to talk and then come up with the peace treaties. And that was very impressive. And yeah, there were some successes. And the result was unfortunately the actual battle. So the Toyotomi was attacked by the Tokugawa and it was eradicated like completely, like the house was discontinued. However, there were some efforts of women, you know, before that, um, you know, major incident. Um, They're really trying to stop that. And then I think it was unsuc unsuccessful, but still a good story to, you know, um, to tell. And also like good story to sort of remind ourselves, like, you know, what's more important, you know, um, is that the actual, like, you know, um, consequence of the wars or some people who tried to stop that. And then I will say, you know, the people who try to do something and try to encounter the major issues. And, you know, these are the things that we would like to stop and think. So that's my group number three um, of the Lady Samurai. Yeah, yeah it's, I mean, and it's so common that those 
like the negotiators, the behind the scenes uh, mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. who kind of help navigate all these conflicts. Mm-hmm. They fall behind, you know, they, they, they don't get much recognition. It's right. just the, blo- the, the bloodbath and the battle that everyone wants to talk about. Mm-hmm. But, <laughs> but uh, really, is it those those people are so influential. And like you said, maybe it isn't successful. But the fact that they're introducing those opportunities to avoid conflict is important. Because again, maybe the winner will say, hey, look, we lost a lot of people. We could have avoided this altogether had we just gone a different way. Right. While you were teaching these classes, um, at what point did you decide to uh, take some of your course content and put it into book form? Um, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, is that is it was it an opportunity to highlight some things in your book that you were unable to speak to in your classes? Uh-huh. Um, you know, just from a time perspective, like were you able to get into a little bit more detail here and there? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sure. Um, so the first year when I started this class called the Lady Samurai, um, only 16 students um, were enrolled. So it was a small class. You know, you can imagine like 16 people sitting in one room and um, 14 of them were women and only two men. And so that was like really a very small class. But then second year, which I offered the same content, um, and then the class title was the Lady Samurai. Um, the class size became like over a hundred. Oh wow! Um, and I was like, wow! Like it's this really a Word big class fast, now, huh? <laughs> right? And then the gender balance became fifty-fifty. I was like, wow! That's like a great achievement that not only women but men like to hear the story about, you know, the Lady Samurai. Yeah. And then the third year, our enrollment um, exceeded uh, two hundred fifty. So that was like a sharp rise in yeah. the interest of uh, Japanese history. So I realized on the third year, like talking to my friends in Japan about how the Japanese history gained attention at Harvard, um, the responses from my colleagues in Tokyo uh, were that, you know, uh, we just want to know about it as well because the Lady Samurai, um, you know, were not really taught uh, at school. That's like a concept or the word that I made up. So why don't I introduce that um, as a book form? And can I write it? And, you know, I, I mean, I wrote it, but, you know, they're just really uh, interested in interviewing and so on. So um, I was like, you know, teaching this um, big class and then thought like, you know, this will be a really interesting and also um, very interesting story to tell. So I decided to write the book really quickly um, at the beginning of the year and the book came out in May so that was like really uh, quick you know the short uh, span of time that the book came around. Um, What what was the title of your book? That was called um, Harvard Hakunetsu Nihon Shi Kyoshitsu so that one became the sort of instant bestseller in Japan which was really really unexpected. Yeah, I, I saw that too. Um, you know, your book became a bestseller in Japan. Um, you know, it was clearly well received. Uh, you were named one of the top 100 influential people in Japan in 2012. Um, you know, what what did you think your was the biggest impact of of the of that book of of your writings, and what what it had on your Japanese readers um, once the book was released? Do you think it like changed their perception right. uh, of? The, the influential roles that women played in Japanese history? Right. So that um, actually relate to something that I did not answer from your previous question, like what I could not include in the book, which was the podcast, for example, or like the movie component of the class. So I wanted to show like, you know, how the students made podcasts um, mm-hmm. on Japanese history or like, you know, the iMovies and so on. But that could not be included in the book, obviously. And so the the really like interesting part was that I used those technologies in history class, which like, you know, traditionally is all about writing books and writing, you know, papers and so on. Yeah. So people were surprised. So like, wow, you know, can you do history class with them, you know, new media, like podcasts and like, you know, movie making and so on? That's more fun, right? So that was like really like, you know, um, inspirational for many educators right. that you know they have more tools to use in their classrooms so that was like one major thing that influenced people you know they start thinking about the traditional ways of learning history to like you know more into the you know current um yeah time right? yeah you adapt to your your target audience right you you right. kind of 
tap into the way they learn and they, they right. take in and media. And also then、uh, there are many women who were abroad and also wanted to、um, have their voice、uh, heard. So that was、yeah. really like, you know, the, the force that I had behind me. So like I'd be representing, you know, that the women who wanted to talk and then I have like conversation with them, you know, making that available、um, to the public and so on. So they're like a group of people who are really enthusiastic about、um, pushing the women,、um, gender equality and so on. That's great. So that was the second, you know, sort of,、um, you know,、um, wind that、uh, supported me through this process. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, that was your impact in Japan. And then also here, I mean, was there any other type of、um, impact that your research had around people, for one people around the world? I mean, I know your book was published in Japanese, but do you ever intend to maybe, yeah, yeah, do you ever intend to put, make an English copy? I would love to, <laughs> right? Right.、Uh, I, I, I am actually writing that.、Um, so,、um, Hopefully, soon that I can make an announcement. Oh,、But、great. Definitely.、Um, oh, breaking news、version. right here. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yes, there's、uh, so many、uh, opportunities、um, to present this work. And so far, it has been the、um, big summit.、Um, like, what was it? It was the World Government Summit, for example, in Dubai.、Um, so, those were the platforms that I used. But Um, in Africa, for example, I went to university and presented this work, and I realized, like, wow,、well, you know, there is a demand of knowing about Japanese history more, but also about women, and you know, also about you know, importance of non violence and you know, peacemaking and so on. So, I would love to emphasize more on that, you know, the peacemaking、yeah. and try to,、um, you know,、um, tell the story in English. That's great, you know,、um, and obviously. You know, part of that impact that you've had around the world is more recent with,、uh, with the release of the Age of Samurai documentary series、right. on Netflix.、Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm, I, I, I mm-hmm. didn't even know it was coming out. I, I listened to、um, <laughs> one of the other narrators on, on, your,、uh, on the show, Isaac Meyer. I listen to his History of Japan、uh-huh. podcast、uh, every, whenever I get a chance to listen、mm-hmm. to it. And,、um, you know, I, I heard on his podcast that he was, I saw the caption, he's like, Due to my newfound stardom on Netflix. And I was like, what? <laughs> and so then I looked up and I was like, oh, wow, there's a, there's a you know, series on, on the Age of Samurai. I got to watch this. So I, I went in really excited to watch it and I was blown away.、Mm-hmm. It was so much fun, you know, really informative. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.、Um, you know, there were some pieces that I wasn't really familiar with. So it was good to kind of fill in some of those gaps、uh, regarding Japanese history.、Um, you know, how was it to collaborate with those fellow historians and, you know, that, and put together such a, an, a, Well received. I mean, it was number one on Netflix for a、That's、couple、right. weeks, I think.、Right. And you know how that changes every,、right. you know, every time they release、right. something. It,、right. Yeah, but it was there for a while in the, in, in the top、And、five. And also in the UK, actually. Oh, yeah. yeah? It went well in the,、um, in the UK as well.、Um, oh, good. It hit、yeah. number one at one point. And yes. Wow.、Right. Yeah, it was,、uh, from what I heard, it was a hit worldwide. <laughs> you know, everyone <laughs>、uh, that had a chance to watch it. So,、yeah. um, you know, well, what was it like working with everybody to put that together? Well, actually, I. Did not collaborate, unfortunately. So, how it worked was that、um, the producer and directors came to London and I was interviewed. Okay. And I only knew about my parts, which were the women.、Oh, so, I did、okay. not know like, how it becomes and like, how other people were、um, working on this, you know, the same project. So, unfortunately,、um, it was not the real collaboration, which I hope that the next time will be. Yeah.、Um, but it's a re- really interesting sort of、um, take on making the Japanese history available in English language. Yeah, you, we would have never have known that it wasn't a collaboration. They, they did a great job of, you know, it would have、right. thought that, okay, maybe、right. they had you guys on separate、Very、phone separate calls or. <laughs> Like most of us know each other, but、um, yeah. yes, we are not、uh, in talk with、um, each other at that point. So, which was great. Like many people will have a say on the different characters and different sides of the story. So, that was really interesting to watch it in the end. And I was the one who, were supervi-、uh, who was supervising the、um, English Japanese translation.、Um, Of the subtitles.、And so. Oh, okay. So, so you were helping、um, out with that. I, too. I、okay. got to see the, the film beforehand and it was really、uh, interesting to see um, um, you know, the many opinions and you know, ways to interpret the events. So I learned a lot from it. 
Um, so that was really an interesting thing. But because that was the documentary drama, there are some、uh, errors remaining in there. So, you know,、sure. definitely that's, you know, that's like pros and cons of making a drama. So that was one. You have to、thing. make it entertaining、mm, a little entertaining bit. Entertaining、right? a little bit <laughs> and so on. So, you know, there are so many things that、uh, would be like, you know, need more explanation, which is natural.、Um, so that's one、right. thing that, that, you know, that historians were remaining here to do this job. So it's great that, you know, the, the drama is out and people are interested. So that's really great. So, another thing that I wanted to、um, point out was also the presence of women in this、um, program. So, only two of us, like female、uh, commentators, were there. And that was like really a minor、um, sort of like representation. I hope that next time that will be more women, like 50 50 at least, you know, to be commenting.、Yeah. And also about the unification that was about men's society, like, you know, how、um, men fought with the, against each other. But The woman's、mm-hmm. part was not the side story. So, the next time for sure, that I would like to emphasize like, you know, the integration of both the stories from men, from women, you know, told together.、Yeah. So, there are many lessons to be learned from that project. So, it was the first step, though. It was really a nice introduction、yeah. to the Japanese history, and I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Yeah, well, it introduced me to the whole I, I had no idea. I never heard of the Lady Samurai or any, any, any of that. I don't want to say behind the scenes, but like the, the, the negotiation part that they took place in and really how they help navigate a lot of these, these conflicts and, and everything. So, I, for me, that was huge to introduce me to that because that made me curious、mm-hmm. to learn more.、Mm-hmm. Um, so,、mm-hmm. I can't wait till your book comes、right. out so I can read it. <laughs> and hopefully, the Netflix again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be great.、Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Right.、Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah.、Um, You know,、uh, what was, if you go back to the, the series, what was your favorite segment of the final product? Like, what was, what did you, like, if you had to pick one episode or one scene,、um, which one did you think was most powerful? Right.、Uh, my favorite was Date Masamune、um, and his relation with Hideyoshi. So that has always been ambiguous. And Nene was in the middle,、um, sort of making、um, the two. Being friends, you know, or at least, you know, to be an ally、um, of each other. So、yeah. that was like really a, you know, fragile relationship between Date Masamune and Toyotomi Hideyoshi. So that episode on Masamune、um, was my favorite. And also about、um, many places where,、um, you know, some sort of scenery of Not just fighting, but also like just a scenery to make us imagine, like, you know, what, what's happening. Yeah. So I think the movie did really well in a sense to sort of like let us fill the gaps, you know, by not showing everything. So I think those are the blank parts where, like, I thought that was a good effect, you know, of not showing like or leading too much you、yeah. know, from, from this. So I, I thought, like, you know, there are some segments, you know, of pose and just. You know, nature, you know, those scenery and scenic view. I think that was really、um, good effect. Yeah, it really set the tone. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I, I loved it. It was great.、Mm. Um, you know, outside of, your,、um, outside of the Lady Samurai chorus, you know, what was another, what, what was one of your next, your next favorite topic to talk on、um, when teaching Japanese history?、Mm. Um, is it, was there a specific time period or a specific Uh, dynamic or,、uh-huh. or conflict or something like what was your? Well, there are so many.、Um, <laughs> you、no. let me talk for another hour, please. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Right. <laughs> yeah. So,、um, another thing obviously was、um, diplomacy. So, the history of Japan and its diplomacy is one of my main themes. So, when I was teaching the Lady Samurai class,、um, I was also teaching the class called Kyoto, the diplomacy. So, the time frame was from 1543 to 1643. So,、um, that was、okay. 100 years of how Kyoto、uh, became the place for diplomacy with other nations.、Um, so, that was like one class that I taught, and I still be very interested in you know, talking about Japan and its、uh, history of diplomacy and the origin story of like how it became, you know, sort of、uh, in, just really.、Uh, You know, this seclusion policy that、uh, Japan introduced, you know, to, to shut the doors, you know, from、um, Western countries and also、um, many others. Yeah. So I think that was really interesting move 
um, and how the diplomacy again started to open at the end of uh, Edo. So I think the diplomacy has, um, you know, many things, um, you know, bringing many things to Japan and so on. So I think that was the next project for me to work on. And also, um, period wise, I just been to Hiroshima actually. Um, yes, I just okay. came back last night um, from Hiroshima. Oh wow! And you know this this place has uh, many things to tell to the world, and also the world has an attention to onto it. So I think you know the the history of the post World War Two. That's one thing that mm-hmm. I'm very interested in looking at further. So recently, I made a um, documentary on the History Channel. Like I was uh, one of the in, uh, person interviewed. For this show, but it's called the Tokyo Legacy, okay. and uh, that was the post-war Japan, starting from um, atomic bomb to um, to 2020, the pandemic. So um, that was like really interesting time period, which I was interested, but I never really worked on. So that sparked my, you know, next, um, you know, sort of inspiration to do more about, you know, how um, things went, and. Uh, Not only Japanese people, but the world would like to know the progress of the afterwar, you know, the aftermath of all those yeah. you know, um, disasters. So I think you know it's like historians' sort of mission to take on, you know, like how things are going to mm-hmm. introduce, to introduce it. Yeah. it, you know, from the multiple angles. So I've been interested yeah. in doing more of that work uh, in the future. That's great. Yeah, well, I, I look forward to seeing that. I, I had heard of um, the, the History Channel documentary series too, um, but is, is that streaming anywhere? Do you know? Uh, I, I wish I, I I went online or somewhere to find it, but I just uh, I was struggling, so I didn't know if you had an insider. Right. <laughs> uh, I actually heard that they might be broadcast in America, so that's why okay. it's not available online yet. So we'll okay. see um, if you know the um, broadcast in America would not happen. Then the the next step will be online. So um, gotcha. yes, soon uh, sooner or later, I think you get to see it. But it was a fun show, and it really introduces um, the Japanese society and its progress um, from 1946 onward. Yeah, 45, 46 onward. Yeah, and and you mentioned mm. uh, Hiroshima too. And I, I actually, uh, let's see. Oh, I want to say it was 2008 or 2009. I, I did a road trip with some friends while I was in Japan, and H- Hiroshima was one of the places. Oh, I say road trip, but it was road slash train. We, yes. <laughs> we rented a car and dropped it off, and then took a train. But uh, we uh, Hiroshima was one of the places we went to. And you know, as an American in high school and college, you're introduced to history from an American perspective, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that was one of the first times I had seen it from. The opposite perspective, mm-hmm. you know, it was mm-hmm. really, 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 really eye-opening for me mm. um, to see it and go to the Peace Museum and and really kind of take everything in mm-hmm. from without the you know the I don't want to say the American twist to it, but um, just from a different perspective. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important for people in mm-hmm. general mm-hmm. Uh, when learning about cultures. Is mm-hmm. not everyone's going to have the same take, right? So right. Just understanding both sides of the same right. coin is really important, right? Right, definitely. So that's the multiple angles、um, that we're looking into. And、um, recently, I also learned that there was a presence from、um, from Australian、um, forces and so on, stationed in the you know right after the、um, atomic bomb was dropped. So not right after. I mean, like maybe a few months later. But、yeah. I did not know anything about it until、huh. now. And that was really an interesting things to、uh, learn more about. So you know, as you say, multiple angles. You know, that exactly what we need from. Yeah,、that. yeah.、Mm. You just you can learn so much when you look at it from someone else's point of view.、Mm-hmm, definitely. I, I、right. can't wait and and look forward to your future projects. You.、Um, you know, Japanese history spans. You know, I don't want to say thousands of years because <laughs> it's you know a couple thousand, but I mean there are some that go pre you know BC or. or However, you may want to call it, but、um, but unlike the U.S., the U.S. is a baby <laughs> to a lot of other countries in the world.、Um, you know, if someone wanted to dive into studying Japanese history, right? 
what would you recommend as a good starting point? Right. Well, definitely the Sengoku. So like, you know, around 1600. It's kind of a fun, fun you know, place, a lot of, lot right, of stuff, stuff happening. Stuff happening and it was a very exciting time. You know, one of the origin story of Japan um, is there. So that's definitely recommend it. Um, but I think it doesn't really have to be like, you know, a study of it. You know, it could be some sort of like, you know, um, sort of, spying you know like just to investigate like you know what this object is all about and so on so you know japan comes into um many um materials that we use now like even computer or like you know many things like you know things is made up of you know many cultures and you know many places yeah. so i think i'd like to like have like a little go on like say this box you know you have it here what how Japan would be related in you know historical sense. So I think I like those kind of you know um, investigations of like you know, trying to see where Japan uh, you know um, comes into play. So I think there yeah. may, may be many approaches rather than just you know going to the book and then see you know and study and so on. So I hope that many people will pick up you know some object of their you know favorite um, and you know try to see like you know um, the connection with Japan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like that's a, a lot of uh, U.S. folks have a lot of hi interest in learning, not just about Japanese history, but just kind of history around the world. Because, again, U.S. history, it comes over from Europe, so it kind of carries over. So growing up, you learn a lot about Europe. But when it comes to Asian cultures and, you know, other, you know, Eastern Europe or Asian cultures, there's a lot that's there that you're not really exposed to. And it's so much deeper and, and there's a lot further you can dig back to really get to the root of something um and i think that's a fascination that a lot of people get um when looking at you know the other countries histories because again u.s is very much you know a 300 something year yeah you know right, 400 years right. i guess if you go to the colonial years but um you know it's mm -hmm. kind of short compared to a lot of other countries right, and, and right, continents right. well that's why the global history is the way to go now you know, just to think about one particular country to start with, and then you started to think about more countries and their histories. So I think, you know, it's a good approach like now that we are able to do that. And that's really a fantastic age that we live in. Yeah, yeah. And and being with all the online resources, too, yes. and, and right? variety of ways to take in that, that, uh, that knowledge, you know, podcasts mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. books mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, streams on Netflix right. even <laughs> right um it's great it's great um you, you now I didn't have this question really in here but you, you mentioned earlier that um that you're doing you're researching into the history of math mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I, I I math is one of my favorite subjects growing up so yes. I was always kind of fascinated I was really good with uh my mom was a math teacher so oh, that, that was kind of always driven mm. into my mind right <laughs> So I always kind of enjoyed algebra and, and, and trigonometry and even calculus. And people would look at me weird when I say that. I, now you ask me now, I don't remember anything. But <laughs> back in high school, I was really good at it. Um, Wonderful. But, mm. but what is, so what exactly is the history of math? Uh, I'm right. curious how, how you go about researching that. That's fascinating. Right. So that's actually the top secret. But oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. my next <laughs> book in English, actually first book, uh, written in English uh, together with my collaborator um, will be the global history of mathematics. Oh, cool. So that will be out and uh, we just um, actually have a good um, contract. So um, it's a fantastic thing to announce that my first book will be the history of math um, in English. There you go. More breaking so, news more over here. breaking news here. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I, I'm able to tell um, to the world. And so, you know, like many people will ask, like, so what is it? Like, is it about equations or is that about like Einstein? Like, who should I be thinking of? Yeah. And so many people will be thinking about like big figures like Leibniz, like Newton and so on. But like, we just don't know where to begin, you know, the history of mathematics and who to be really like picking up. So right now, what we are doing uh, in this book is that uh, from ancient to present, that we would like to um, pay attention to big figures, but also the minor figures whose story were worth telling, but never being told. Okay. So really like, you know, many women's achievements in the history of maths, we just don't know many of them, yeah. but they exist. So my part is to introduce like, you know, female um, figures in the history of maths. 
and also because I was in Africa, uh, South Africa, mm-hmm. uh, I would like to draw connections between Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. Cool. So I would like to have like you know more interactions in the you know the main narrative. So not just like Europe and like those big figures you know set up the you know equation of A and B and so on. Mm-hmm. But there are many variations to it, and it has not been like introduced together. So this book is doing something um, of really like looking at the world, you know, as a whole. And it would like to tell the story of like stepping stone from one place to the next and trying to see like, you know, or capture like what the history of mathematics is all about. So there are like many interesting, you know, bits in this. And I would like to, you know, really provide new insights from the global history perspective. That's awesome. Yeah, that mm. sounds really interesting. Like kind of painting a picture for everybody to see really, like, you know, like you said, stepping stones going so, right? um, to modern day. That's awesome. Right, right. Well, I mean, that's that's pretty much everything. We covered so much. I mean, if you want to go back and, and talk about, you know, the history of what was right. it? <laughs> um but yeah i mean uh this was so much fun i'm so glad that you were able to join us uh for this interview i know our listeners are gonna love it um you you know did if you had anything else that's come up outside the two breaking news items that you dropped earlier well so my recent book in japanese was just out in february so that's in the bookstores or amazon right now and uh, the cover is nene so that's the wife of Hideyoshi. Okay. So I tell like detailed story about uh, her life in this and the TV program about it is coming up in June. So oh, wow. please okay. um, visit my website and uh, there will be a show. Um, we just filmed it last week. <laughs> so oh, cool. it'll be really nice to introduce um, Nene and her life uh, with the background, which was uh, Nene's cloister. So like where Nene stayed um, in her late years. So that was really a fascinating um, project, and I'm very excited to share this with many people. So, will it will um, it be on NHK or? Uh, that's actually from BS Asahi. Oh, okay, okay, mm. cool. Right. So, anyone listening so, in Japan, BS Asahi, please yes, and check come it to out my website. June. When I can announce <laughs> it, I'll post it on the first page. <laughs> awesome. Well, I, I right. have. Uh, I'll, I'll let my sister-in-law and mother-in-law oh know, please so let them check know it out. and they can uh, <laughs> send you a coffee hopefully <laughs> oh yeah okay well that that's that's all we have for today this is again so much fun thank you so much again for uh, joining us thank you for, uh, having for the me. podcast interview mm-hmm. um i know our listeners are gonna love listening to it i know um our hosts uh they unfortunately couldn't join us today for the interview but i know nigel specifically is a huge history fan i know he's gonna love it and same for same for Maddie and Jennifer just have a fascinating with Japanese culture. And I feel like you learn so much from just different looking at different aspects uh-huh. of Japan, mm-hmm. history, history, yes. culture, all the different things. It's you learn a little bit something new everywhere you go. So thank you again. Uh, it's so much fun. It was fun, too. Thank you very much for having me. And just like that, this week's journey has come to an end. Thank you so much for tuning in. In today's episode, we unsheath our verbal katana as we talked Age of Samurai before transitioning over to our awesome conversation with Tomoko Hikitagawa, where she highlighted a different set of impact players during the Sengoku period, the Lady Samurai. Who were some of your favorite historical figures from the Sengoku period? Were you familiar with the Lady Samurai prior to the Age of Samurai or this podcast episode? Share your thoughts with us on Instagram and Twitter at Crew of Japan Podcast. That's at k-r-e-w-e-o-f-j-a-p-a-n or send us an email at crewofjapanpodcast at gmail.com i'll spell that out for you because why not k-r-e-w-e-o-f-j-a-p-a-n-p-o-d-c-a-s-t at gmail.com subscribe drop us a comment drop us an email tell us how we're doing let us know what you're thinking of the podcast and let us know if you have some ideas for future episodes we can't wait to hear from you but that's it for today until next time Thank you.